And uh, we are online, so let's say hi to our brothers and sisters that are watching us online. Hello. Hello. God bless you. I'm so glad you're watching. Well, I praise God for everybody that's here in person. And if you're online, you're looking for a church, come to church. Come join us over here. It's, it's fun in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? It's fun to be in here. It's fun to praise together. There's something contagious when, when we start praising together. Have you noticed that? It's fun. Hey, you get together and God inhabits the praises of his people. And we're in here, and I just, I just love it. I just love it. Uh, if you have your Bibles today, we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We'll be starting at uh, verse 13 today in Matthew chapter 5. So I'd encourage you to turn there. If you don't have a Bible, I want to let you know that you can, uh, you can have a Bible. Just see me after the service or, or see some or during it. We can get you one if you need a Bible, okay? Let us know. It's a gift from the church for you. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 13, we read the following. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now may God bless the reading of his word this morning. Uh, let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for inhabiting your praises, Father, and I pray that you would just speak to us right from your word this morning. That you would say what you want to say, Lord, just get me out of the way, and that you would speak clearly uh, to every heart, every mind that is gathered here in person, that is gathered online, Lord. Uh, I praise you and I thank you for it, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want to just start off uh, this, this sermon by, by sharing how wonderful it's been to see God working in each one of you. Uh, it blesses this old pastor's heart uh, to, to see God doing a work in each one of you. I want to remind you of some things that have happened just during since we started this series on I love this church and I, I love this church. Anybody love this church? I love this church. God has blessed us to have this church. But even as we started this series just now in the last few weeks, we've been blessed to have a church picnic together. We've been blessed to have new people start joining our number. I'm so glad that you all are here, by the way. You know who you are. You're, you're new. We love you. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, we're blessed to, we were blessed to have a baby shower together for the first time, and I don't know how long. That was so wonderful, and I, I'm looking forward to more, right? Uh, and we've been able to help the community as well. I want you to stop and think about that, too. And just in this, these few weeks that we've been celebrating loving this church, uh, we were able to help a family move. Uh, we were able to do that. We've been able to reach out to the community with dialysis and cancer care packs. It's making a difference. It's blessing lives in Jesus' name, right? And now we're in the midst of starting up a brand new Sunday night uh, meeting, and I know God's going to bless that also. Uh, so again, you don't want to miss that as Sunday nights at 6 o'clock. But I'm happy to report to you that God is at work here in Abingdon Church of the Nazarene. It's not going to stop anytime soon. I know he's going to continue to do a work. I'm looking forward to our end of September meeting. I'm looking forward to a glory way coming in October. That's going to happen too. But God is at work in this church. And if you notice all of my previous statements I was talking about, there is this continuing phrase, this continuing theme. Every single time I talked about something happening, it wasn't happening to just one person or another. It was happening together. It was happening together. You see, together we are called to be his ambassadors. Together. Together we are called to be his children. That's together. Together we are a family of God. Amen? Yeah. That's together. Together we're called to grow that family also. To be kingdom builders for his kingdom come. For his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Yeah. What a tremendous charge that is from God Almighty. And what an awesome responsibility it is also, but oh, beloved, what a privilege it is to have that just right there at our grasp. We have this good news, you see, that's not meant to keep to ourselves. It's too good to keep to yourselves. And we shouldn't keep that to ourselves. We should take every opportunity to 
share that with somebody that needs to hear it. You never know where they're going to be. They might be at work. They might be at school. Or we just pray for our kiddos going to school. It might be at some other places too. It might be uh, taking dialysis, wouldn't it? You just never know. But somebody needs the good news. Beloved, I praise God for what's going on right here. Now, I want to encourage you all to keep reaching, keep inviting, because I know, I know that God is going to keep blessing. Amen? Amen. He is. So in Matthew chapter 5, we, we read that our Lord Jesus is teaching on the mountainside. He, I, I like that he likes mountains, by the way. I think, I think it's great. He, he likes mountains, and he's teaching his, his followers, his children, if you will, what it means to truly be children of Almighty God. Right here in Matthew 5. And it's important that we get this because our culture uh, that we have grown up in uh, mostly does not instill values that emphasize what Christ is emphasizing here in Matthew chapter, chapter 5. Because Matthew chapter 5 is all about surrender to God. It really is. It's all about surrender to God. It's about maintaining and keeping and striving for an openness to Almighty God and His leading and His direction and His purpose in our lives. Now that takes the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know you can't do that by yourself? I, I hope you know. If you read Matthew chapter 5 and you go through the Beatitudes, you, you can't do that in your own power. You just can't. Don't even try. You want to be surrendered to God. You know what the end result is when you are really surrendered to Him? When you are in that room of grace like we talked about in our, our Sunday night meeting last Sunday, the end result when God comes up next to you and he puts his arm around you and he works on you and he works in here and he does that transforming work in your heart, it's Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness. See, the more we surrender to him, the more he's going to show up in our lives. That's how that works. If I surrender to God, there's not more of Lee that's going to come out. He might remove some of that junk of Lee in, in my life, but more of him is going to come out. And the more we'll start acting like him, the more we'll start thinking like him, the more we'll start sounding like him, the more we're going to start loving like him in our world and beyond. The more our lives will point directly to him in what we do, in what we say, and in who we are. Let's see, Christ is talking to his followers here in this passage, and he calls them in verse 13 through 16, he calls them the salt and the light. Somebody say salt and, salt and light. If you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ right now, he's talking to you too. And he's saying you, beloved, you. Point to somebody around you. You are the salt and the light. Now what are the qualities, what are the characteristics of salt and light? When we look at this, well, in the ancient world, salt was a valued commodity. It was a value commodity. They couldn't go to Walmart and get salt back then, okay? Uh, the refining process was, was very difficult. So they actually used to use salt as a currency, a form of currency back then. It's where we get the term salary from came from that. They used to pay soldiers with salt. Can you imagine that? Here's your salt. Good work this week. Now for us, for us that, that's, that's weird. But, but back then it was so important because salt was a powerful preserving agent. It was also a flavoring agent. It was a precious commodity back then. Now what does salt do? Salt brings taste, doesn't it? It brings flavor. It's a flavoring agent. It brings taste to bland food. It preserves. Now I consider myself a barbecue connoisseur. I got any barbecue connoisseurs with me in the house today? I, I, my brother Joey, he's watching online right now. But yes, Joey is a, Joey is a barbecue connoisseur. Uh, I'm going to convert some more barbecue connoisseurs before the year is over. Uh, I, I can tell you that there's nothing sadder. As, as a barbecue connoisseur, I can tell you there's nothing sadder in this world than unseasoned, unflavored barbecue. It just makes me sad. Just makes me sad. That mess with anybody else. I, I I I've been to certain restaurants before and tried, and and it was just so bland, and it tasted like the pork had been boiled or something. It was it was bad. It was bad. There was no smoke. Uh, now now, if you want to have good barbecue, you have to have that good smoke in it. You have to have that rub, or you have to have that sauce and that seasoning. Otherwise, it's just a bland old pig. Just a bland old pig. Seasoning, in particular, salt, keeps it from being that bland old pig. You look at your neighbor and say, we don't like bland old pigs, do we? 
Now we get to this world, we get to this world and the sin and the monotony of the sinful life and the way it shackles us and the way that it, and it really messes up our whole world. It's kind of like a bland old pig. On the outside, it might look great. It might look like a really good cut of barbecue until you taste it. You're like, oh, what is that? Bland old pig. So, I don't want us to miss what Jesus is saying in this, in this uh, analogy he's giving. He's making it clear how necessary and how important we are for the world, okay? Because we have experienced, we have experienced a transformation in Christ Jesus. We are not the same as we used to be. We carry something inside that the world cannot offer. Because we have that, uh, we, we, we are God's chosen instruments of influencing the world for good. The only goodness that's gonna come into this world is gonna be by God's hand. And if you are open and letting him work through you, something wonderful can happen in this world. Otherwise, it's just bland old pig. <laughs> Think about that. The kingdom life that we possess, it, it is valuable for the effects that we have in our daily circles of influence. Think about the people that you are around on a day-to-day -day basis. Think about the people that you're in contact with. Think about how many people might right now be suffering from the bland old pig of the sinful world. I mean, some of them look like it, right? You might be going into the town, they just look like they were beat up and look like they ate sour lemons. It's like, oh, what a day. I, I run into friends sometimes that have sadly spent most of their life chasing worldly pursuits and has left them empty. And there's so many things that they lost. And, and, and sometimes I can lead them back to Christ and lead them to the, the, the good news of Jesus Christ and it changes their whole outlook and their response is always the same. Why would I miss that? Why did I miss this my entire life? So we want to make sure that we are embracing that call on our life as salt. You're meant to influence. You're meant to permeate the society that you are in. Uh, Christ calls us to be in the world, not of the world, but in the world. And when we're in there, it changes it for his glory. Amen. They're called to be the light of the world also. Now, in Jesus' time, they had these little tiny lamps. And little tiny lamps don't give off a whole lot of light, do they? So what they would do is they would put it up on a lampstand. So it would give light to the whole room. It was important that they would do that so they could see, okay? Even the smallest of lights, when it's lifted up against the pitch black darkness, it can remove that darkness. That's in the same way Jesus' life and message of salvation brought light to us. And you think about how much we stick out compared to the rest of the world. That's a dark, bland, old world, right? And you think about what it looks like when we have the light of God's love in us. How much does that stick out? How much does that make a difference? His disciples are a living demonstration of the kingdom of heaven. You ever stop and think about that? When you are letting Christ live in you, you are being a living demonstration of what he wants. When you are actually living for him. Wow, think about the difference that that makes in the world around you. Think about how much different that is to live a life of selflessness versus a life of selfishness. Because this world is very selfish. Not only bland, not only dark, it's very selfish. But Christ call, calls us to live a life of selfless love, agape love. How much different is that than the rest of the world? Hmm. Don't miss that light removes the darkness. We not only carry the light of the gospel of the kingdom of God, but we are that light. That's what Jesus said. Because of his work, the spirit in our lives, our transformation has produced kingdom light in us, affecting every aspect of our being. It changes the polarity of our hearts. It changes the way that we act. It, it changes us into positive influences in this sin-stained, old, dark, bland, pig world. Think about that. Not only flavor it, we help to light it up. We help people to see what real light is, and really it's a reflection of that light that is beaming down from him to the rest of the world. So as salt and light, we bring taste and atmosphere of Jesus' kingdom, his essence, if you will, into this world, into this world. And when we do that, we become kingdom builders, kingdom builders. It amazes me to think that God entrusts this to us. 
What an awesome responsibility that is. What an awesome privilege that is to be these heralds of God's good news. We didn't generate this ourselves, but we are entrusted with it. We're entrusted with it. Now think about way back in Genesis 1. What did God do? Okay, God said, he was talking about mankind here. Genesis 1 verse 26, he said, Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That's what he said about man. He wanted to take care of it. Now I want you to think about what Jesus is saying here with us. When Jesus establishes his kingdom, Jesus entrusts that to us as disciples. We are to bring the taste. We are to bring the light. And we are to bring Jesus' community and kingdom experience to our areas where we're at, to our societies, to our cities, to our towns, to our people. We're supposed to bring that. And we think about that. And I want you to consider what do you not like about the world that you're in right now. Chances are it might be darkness, might be something sinful. Now I want you to also think about what would God have me to do to change that? Think about that. We're called to be influencers. If we're discouraged that our area, our world that we're living in right now is a mess, we need to consider what we're doing to change that. Not by our own power, of course, but surrendering to God and asking our Heavenly Father, if we're doing what we can to help lighten that up, if he, is, if he is calling us to go out into that world and to share his good news. Hmm. When we intentionally love each other, and we intentionally love one another, when we are intentionally using our giftings to live out the love of God towards one another outside of these walls, we are bringing the salt and the light to the world around us. The salt, the light of God's love. We're saying when we do that, yes, I love my church and I love it so much I want to tell you about it. I love my Jesus this much. I want to tell you about it. I want to tell you about it. Hmm. People who experiencing, experience Jesus' transformational power in their lives, they're going to be inclined to do just that, to tell somebody else about it. And we see these Beatitudes that are in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, the Beatitudes are actually part of this, okay? Uh, we see the Beatitudes in chapter 5, verses 2 through 10. We see the values of the kingdom of God. And we see chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. We see the promise. You know, Jesus promises us that life isn't going to be easy, that people will persecute for that. But he also promises great is your reward. And we finally have this charge when he tells us to step out, that we're the salt and we're the light. Jesus has brought the kingdom of God through regeneration and renewal by the Spirit. He transforms us, beloved. And the Spirit produces in us things like meekness and mercy and purity and peace and that hungering and that thirsting for righteousness. We know we can't do it ourselves. So we hunger, we thirst after God. And these are characteristics of Jesus' disciples that allow God to establish his kingdom in his way. When we are surrendered to him, when we are hungering and thirsting for him, mm, it's so important that we do that. Now, it's really easy for us to just sit here in church and act like a child of God right here in church. But how many of you know it's a lot more difficult to be the salt and the light outside of the building? I love the fellowship that we share here. I love the sanctuary that we have here. We need this to build one another up. But we build one another up with a purpose, too. Because when we get out there, sometimes we're not going to always be loved, are we? But it's in that day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, in the office, or at the school, or at the gym, or on the job, that people need to experience Jesus when they experience us. So we come together, when we lift one another up, we encourage one another to be that salt and that light. And we do that so we can carry that to the world around us. We can carry that to the world around us. We're not supposed to keep it to ourselves, ever. Hmm. I want you to consider, I want you to think about that in moments like that, when you are carrying that out. I, we actually had a, a, a waitress that we, we uh, had her waiting on us a while back, and she had had a miserable day. And we were able to share some good news and some love and kindness with her. And she said, nobody had been like that with me all day. And it was her last 
table uh, that was she was going to be waiting at. It was the last last table she could be waiting as her career at that place. And I think we were able to just leave her some bit of good news and joy that she might not have gotten otherwise. You don't know how much of a difference it makes in other people's life. When people will experience the kingdom from you in those normal moments when you are acting out, when you are surrendered to God, and when you are letting him live through you, people that never even come to church will be able to see Christ when you reflect that to them. And then they will be able to taste and see because of something that you did that the Lord is good. And point them to Christ with what you're doing. That's why it's so important that we don't just come in here and just talk about being church, but that we're actually living it too. Now, Christ even addresses this when he says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. That's what he's saying. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives its light to all who are in the house. Therefore, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify who? Your Father in heaven. Your Father in heaven. We don't do this so that we can receive glory for it. We do it so God can be glorified. We don't surrender so Lee can have superpowers. That's not what it's about. It's about surrendering so God can flow through us to the world around us and that others can be pointed to the good news of Jesus Christ. Hmm. I hope that if we've learned anything over the last few weeks, we've learned that loving the church isn't about loving a building. I love the building that we've got. This is great, but we're going to use it for God's glory. If the building wasn't here, we'd still be a church. Amen? We'd still be a church. Because church begins with our relationships. Church builds with relationships. Church expands with relationships. It starts with our relationship to our Heavenly Father. And when our relationship to the Heavenly Father is open like that, when we are open, He expands our horizons to put us closer to other people that are around us. And just like that salt and that light, that salt that, that brings flavor to things, that light that permeates the darkness, we're meant to go out and to go into the world around us. And we're meant to share that good news with the world around us as He lives through us. It's so important that we remember this. That's why he said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. Is what Jesus said. If you have love for one another. And we need to be more than just examples of that. We need to live that too. We need to absolutely live that. And maybe times, maybe actually maybe right now, this might be, there might be more than any other time in our lifetime that people need to see this. That people need to see real love. Because there's not a lot of real love in the world right now. It's a lot of hatred. It's a lot of bland. There's a lot of darkness. There's a lot of that bland old pig of the world, right? But God's called us to bring his good news to a lost and dying world. And a world of phony stuff and bland, dark, sinful living, may we be so surrendered to the Holy Spirit's will and purpose that people will not just see us, but that they will see Christ in us. Amen? It's what we want. It's what it means to be a disciple. Because he told us to go and to tell the whole world. The loudest testimony you're going to have is the way you're living. It's the way you're living. We can sit in here and talk about Jesus all day long, but when we're out there, are we living Christ to the world around us? It's so important that we remember that. Now, as we do that, we're going to be taking up communion today. We're going to be all oh, dispersing communion, rather, but I'm going to have the, the stewards, if they would come up, and start handing out the elements. And as they come up and uh, get ready to start handing these out, I would ask that you all let God do a searching work in your heart this morning. Because maybe God is wanting to remind you of just what he did through the Lord Jesus Christ for you. Maybe he's wanting to remind you this morning of the importance of surrender and what it means to be the salt and the light in the world around you. God gave up everything for you and he gave his one and his only son for you. And like I said before, that news is too good to keep to yourself. So as we take communion together, I, I, I would encourage you to be so reminded of that. And let's, uh, let's, let's take this together. Now in Luke chapter 22, 
we read starting at verse 14, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and he gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, beloved, the communion supper instituted by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it is a sacrament which proclaims his life, his sufferings, his sacrificial death and resurrection and the hope of his coming again. And it shows forth the Lord's death until his return. This supper, it is a means of grace in which Christ is present by the Spirit. It is to be received in reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work of Christ. All those who are truly repentant, forsaking their sins and believing in Christ for salvation are invited to participate in the death and resurrection of Christ. We come to this table that we may be renewed in life and in salvation and be made one by the Spirit. In unity with the church, we confess our faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Beloved, I would invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we, we gather at this, your table, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who by your Spirit was anointed to preach the good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, set at liberty those who are oppressed. We remember that Christ healed the sick, that he fed the hungry. We remember that he ate with sinners and he established the new covenant for forgiveness of sins. We live in the hope of his coming again. We remember on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke the bread and then he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We also remember that when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, as we gather as the body of Christ to offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving, Lord, we pray that you would pour your Holy Spirit out upon these gifts, that you would make them by the power of your spirit to be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Lord, by your spirit, make us one in Christ, one with each other and one in the ministry of Christ to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. We ask it in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, beloved, as the Lord has taught us to pray, I would encourage you to come pray this with me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ.
broken for you, may it preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Take this bread in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. Take eat. represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for you. May it preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for watching over us. Lord Jesus, that the price that you paid for us is unspeakable, it's unimaginable, but you did it anyway. Lord, as you've loved us, I pray, Lord, that your love would just shine through us in light of this grace that you have just so lavished upon us. None of us in this room or online are worthy of such a grace, but you give it to us so freely. Lord, I pray that you would just remind us of the importance of surrender to you. That we would just turn over this life and everything that you bless us with to you for your goodwill and purpose. Lord, we don't want to go about this life in our own power. We want you to be at the helm of our life, to be the very centerpiece of our life. Lord, I pray that this good news would resonate through us. That we would indeed be the salt and the light that you have called us to be. I praise you for this opportunity just to tell of your good news. We love you so much this morning. We praise your holy name for it. We ask all of these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Now, beloved, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless each one.